Welcome to Recalculating America, a program dedicated to small business in America. Recalculating will help you, the American small business owner, build a new business or help you to grow your existing one. Each week, experts will give you useful information about starting your new business, and you will hear from professionals selected to help you grow your business. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the Editor-in-Chief of the Small Business Digest and has many years of experience helping small businesses build and grow their businesses. Now he is sharing his ideas with you over the air. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. He specializes in helping small business owners make their money work as hard as they do. Now, your host, Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Good morning, this is Dan Perkins, and I'm your co-host along with Don Mazella on Recalculating, a program dedicated to helping small business leaders increase their profits. We draw our name from the best-selling book, which features contributions of more than 100 presidents, experts, and leaders, all of whom offer you ways to grow your small business. And if you go to our website, uh, recalculating.biz, you can figure out how to uh, buy it. Don? You know, at times, it seems the only constant in business are legal challenges. For small business leaders, it means taking the time to better understand the issues often best left to attorneys. Dan, what about our first guest today? Well, today, Don, we have uh, Matthew Horn from Legal Services Link, a uh, a lawyer firm that is helping people deal with legal problems and solutions. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we talk about your company. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you know, my name is Matthew Horn. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing in the Chicagoland area for uh, almost a decade at this point, and I specialize in the, the construction area of law. Um, I began developing Legal Services Link about three or four years ago um, when I was my wife and I were having our first child, and uh, we were we were looking for an estate plan, and <clears throat> I, I work at a fairly large firm with a couple hundred attorneys, but we didn't have any estate planning attorneys. And so um, I tried to get a referral, as most people do when they try to hire an attorney, and I couldn't get a good referral. So I did what everybody else does when they try and find an an attorney, and I turned to the Internet. And what the Internet is, is you do a Google search or you find a directory, and, and you have to go through all these steps. You have to call attorneys and email attorneys and wait for them to get back to you and find out your rates and uh, so I experienced firsthand, despite being an attorney, what a cumbersome process it could be. Um, you know, on the attorney side of it, too, I also realized how difficult it was to find and connect with clients. Um, so, you know, after practicing for uh, six or seven years, I embarked to create this platform, Legal Services Link, uh, that helps people connect with attorneys efficiently and helps attorneys connect with clients uh, at the click of a button. Matthew, um, um, let me ask you a question, uh, a little bit of background first. Uh, as I sure. mentioned to you uh, before, I'm a registered investment advisor, and I uh, manage money individually for individual clients. I do some uh, financial planning and do estate planning. And one of the things as I've developed my practice over 40-some years, it's finding the right lawyer uh, for the right problem uh, unless you go to a very, very large law firm, um, my clients run into the same kind of problem that you had when you started your business. Um, maybe you can give us a little insight from not necessarily, we don't need to know the name of the firm you used to work at, but what happened, because it would seem to me, Matthew, that there has to be a conscious decision on the part of the partners of the law firm we're not going to do this kind of service. Why do you think, given the uh, estate issues in our country, why do you think law firms aren't in that practice? Yeah, I mean, the law firm I worked at was litigation-focused. So we were litigation attorneys, not transactional attorneys for the most part. And so estates and trusts, you know, uh, people don't realize how specialized the law really is. And, you know, it's just like construction. There are plumbers and carpenters, and welders, 
and you know a welder doesn't know how to plumb your house. And so the same thing is true with attorneys. There are many, many, many specialties. And so yep. you have, you know, the smaller firms who have limited specialties and the larger firms who have broader specialties. Um, but I am not, frankly, I'm not aware of any law firm that includes uh, a specialist in every area of law. I don't believe that it exists. And so um, the, the firm that I was at specialized on litigation, so we had a couple hundred litigation attorneys, but nobody that handled the states and trusts. Matthew, uh, we are all about small business, and we're not only uh, dealing with helping businesses that are already started to become more profitable, but we also are encouraging because we believe that this economic recovery when waiting on for eight to ten years might, in fact, be underway with Mr. Trump. Um, as as a as a both an entrepreneur and a lawyer, what do you th- what would you recommend to our listeners today? Uh, if you're going to start a business, what are the core attorney competencies that you need? I mean, you, do you need a, a, a lawyer that specializes in incorporation, um, uh, buy-sell agreements? What, what, what are the basics if I'm going to start XYZ tomorrow? What are the kind of legal expertise do I need, and where should I go to try and find those people, Matthew? Yeah, and so the, the best place that you can start is looking for – a business attorney. And so, you know, there are attorneys out there that are business attorneys and and business attorneys really do a number of things. So they can help you incorporate your business, which is essential. Uh, They can help you draft an operating agreement, setting out how the business is going to run. Uh, They can help you prepare the documents that you need to to create a, a valid corporation. If that's the route you're going bylaws and things like that. Um, you know, generally, if you need any sort of licenses, they can help you through the licensing process. Um, if you need a contract, they can help you draft contracts. So, you know, there are a lot of attorneys out there that refer to themselves as business lawyers, and, and business lawyers can generally do all of those things for you. Now, the larger your business gets, the, the more attorneys you might need. Um, but when you're starting out, especially if you're starting a small business, you should really only need uh, one primary attorney um, at the outset. And if, if you reach out to an attorney and they tell you that they can't do something for you or you need to hire another attorney, my recommendation would be to try and find one attorney that can do it all. Um, it is, um, I know that there's a, in some areas there are what are called um, um, legal referral services that are sponsored by the local bar association, which can help you find attorney based on a particular need is that is there a specific category that's called business attorneys yes and you know actually what legal services link does what we are is we are a we are a platform that allows people to connect with a number of attorneys at one time and so what we what we do that's different is you're right there are the bar um, organizations that have their referral services there are other kind of referral uh, law firms out there. And what we do that's different is we've kind of taken a a technology focus and look at hiring an attorney. And so what we allow people to do, especially small business owners, is instead of searching for an attorney or calling the local bar and asking for a referral, somebody can hop on our website, legalservicesLink.com, post a short summary of their legal needs, and then that is – distributed to all the attorneys in our network uh, that fit that criteria, and they can then respond to that client at one time. And so to answer your question directly, Dan, you know, one of the, when somebody's posting a summary of their legal needs on legal services link, they can select that they're looking for a business lawyer. More importantly, when they're describing their project, they can say, I'm looking to start a, a, a new business and here are the needs that I have. And so that's, instead of having to call an email 50 or 100 different attorneys, they can post that project and it's distributed to the 50 or 100 or 200 attorneys in our network that fit that criteria. And those attorneys then respond to the client. So, um, you know, we're, we're taking the whole referral process one step further, making it even easier for small business owners to find the perfect attorney for them. We, uh, we, uh, we have our program in, in uh, nine cities across the country and 
four of the top ten markets in the country. How widespread are your services available on the your legal services link website? Yeah, we have a our network is national. We have a national um, network, and right now I believe we have approximately fifteen hundred attorneys in our network. We launched wow. about a year and a half ago. Um, we're, we're expected to. Uh, we're actually partnering with a major state bar association, so we're going to have about twenty thousand attorneys in the next few months here. Um, wow! But uh, we have attorneys in every major market, and so if somebody's looking for an attorney in New York or Florida or Chicago, and they post a summary of their their legal needs on the site, they'll get a, at least a couple of responses from attorneys. Hmm. I have one oh. question. Then we'll go to Don. Um, so it sounds, if I understand what you're doing, is that you you're a, in essence a refer an online referral service that helps. Uh, entrepreneurs and people starting a business and other people uh, find a lawyer in their area of expertise, uh, in their area that they need a certain expertise. Is that fair? Yeah, we don't, I, it is fair. We don't, we refer to it as a platform because it's more okay. technology based. Uh, when we think of referral services, like if you call the bar association, they will give you one attorney's name or two mm-hmm. attorney's names. And what we're doing is we're not making the decision, hey, you're only going to get this attorney. You're only going to come in contact with this attorney. We, we are a platform where once you post it, it's automated. There, there is nobody reviewing it. It's a technological route that goes to all of the attorneys, and they can all respond to you. So your options, unlike a referral network, aren't limited. Uh, you receive okay. responses from everybody that, that's interested in working for you. But, but yeah. So, okay. My last question, at least in this segment, is: So, how do you make money? Uh, how does Legal Services Link make money? Yeah, it's completely free for business owners and clients to post their legal needs. Free across the board. Um, it's also free for attorneys to get into our network. But if attorneys want the ability to be able to respond for projects that they're interested in, then they have to pay a small annual fee of two hundred and fifty dollars a year. Okay. Good. Hmm. Super. Don. Uh, we're talking with Matthew Horn. He's the uh, founder and head of Legal Services Link. Uh, this website is www.legalservicesLink.com. Well, my first question, um, Matthew, and I'm fascinated by this, is uh, uh, how do you vet the attorneys? How do, you, uh, uh, how do I know I'm getting a good attorney and not a schlock? Yeah, and so... There are a couple steps. So first off, we we allow people uh, that have worked with the attorneys to post reviews. Uh, So reviews are always a great start. Um, You know, the other thing is when an attorney signs up with us, we do do a review to ensure that they are, in fact, uh, a a practicing attorney. Um, But we don't, you know, unless there are some red flags with the attorney, we don't uh, delete attorneys or block attorneys uh, from using this site. And again, it's, you know, this is a marketplace, so it's about giving you options. And we want the attorney that's one year out of law school on the site, just like we want the attorney that's been practicing for 50 years. So you as the small business owner, when you post your project, you have the option, okay, do I want to pay less for an attorney that's one year out of law school, or do I want to pay more for the attorney that's been practicing for 40 years? You know, it, People don't recognize how many preferences they have when it comes to things like what type of attorney they want to work with. You know, some people prefer to work with younger attorneys who are responsive via text message and email. Some people want an older attorney. Um, And so, you know, what we're about is we're about giving people options and allowing people to go through and say, okay, here are 10 attorneys that want to work for me. I'm interested in talking to these four and then calling those four and picking the perfect one for them. So we don't have any sort of criteria that you need to be practicing for five years or you need to be grossing a certain amount. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it's about giving you, uh, the consumer, as broad options as possible. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if you've seen today's Wall Street Journal, but apparently uh, uh, one of those class action uh, cases rested on the fact that they were – uh, that they were billed over a million dollars uh, by someone who who had been barred for almost 25 years 
from, from law. And the the judge really got after the uh, 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 the attorneys, the uh, the law firm. But the interesting part is the law firm still wants their money, even though he has uh, they, they were using an attorney who was barred. I, I thought that was yeah. very funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen the Wall Street Journal. I haven't seen the story, but um, attorney, uh, you know, law firms want their money, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, there are a lot of attorneys out there that that uh, that are retired that aren't necessarily supposed to be practicing that are. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so, you know, I, I think it's uh, I, I don't think that's uncommon, unfortunately. Well, but let me ask you, um, you say people can po- post uh, um, uh, comments, et cetera, but but. Uh, Beyond checking the, their credentials, is there anything you do to uh, uh, help the uh, uh, small business uh, person who seeks out these attorneys to better evaluate uh, who could be more, uh, 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 who could be a better choice? No, I mean we we leave that primarily up to the consumer. Um, so you know we 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 put the onus on them to do their research. And more importantly, to call the attorney and talk to the attorney. And, and that's really the best way to figure out if, okay, this person's on top of their game and I'm interested in working with them or not. Um, I mean, there are some limited things out there that can be done. People can go and they can visit the uh, local uh, state regist- registration and disciplinary commission to see if there's any discipline. But, you know, the reality is most attorneys have not been disciplined and so that's not really a good indicator as to whether someone is a good attorney or not. What's an indicator as to whether somebody's a good attorney or not is, you know, seeing their reviews and talking to them and, and finding out if they're knowledgeable, if they're responsive and things like that. So, you know, I would say it's just like doing anything else. I mean, I equate our service very much to, to care.com and to match.com and to all of these other platforms out there. And, you know, just like finding a babysitter or finding a potential spouse, um, you know, it's highly subjective. And so what's, what's good to one person might not be good to another person. And so we leave it up to the consumer. To, we provide them with all the information we can, and then we leave it up to them to make a decision. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, do, uh, do you uh, uh, look at it in terms of uh, uh, cost per billable hour or – flat fee for a project. I mean, what's the best way for a small business owner to really go about getting help, legal help of this nature? Yeah. And so that's one of the beautiful things about our site is when a, when a potential client posts their project, they can indicate how they're looking to pay. So if they want to pay hourly or if they want to pay a flat fee, um, they can also indicate what price range they're looking at, whether they're looking to pay a lower end of the price range or, or a media or uh, the middle range or a higher range. And so, you know, w- what I say is if you're opening a new business, if, if you're starting a new business, that attorney should be able to essentially get, offer you a fixed fee as to what it's going to cost for that attorney to incorporate your business, provide you with an operating agreement, uh, get you any necessary licenses. And if that attorney can't offer you a fixed fee or at least give you an idea of the range where that would fall, you know, that's an indication that they probably haven't done what you're asking them to do before. Because if they've done it a bunch of times, they know how much it's going to cost. And so, you know, I think people should always be looking for a fixed fee uh, when possible. And I think that is very possible when starting a business. Now, when you're talking about litigation or or these other things where the time can be extremely variable, you're going to find uh, many attorneys that aren't willing to do fixed fee that will only work on hourly. Um, But, you know, the the good thing about the site is it allows the consumer to say, here's what I want. Who wants to work for me under these, under these criteria? Uh, I'm just going to ask him to go ahead, Don. I was just going to ask him to uh, spell out his site and then turn it over to you, Dan. Okay. Your your website again, Matt? Is yeah, what? it's www.legalservicesLink.com. Okay. 
So let me uh, let me play devil's advocate, if I could, for just a moment. Um, sure. What do you think about a small business company <clears throat> using some of these online legal services where for a flat fee you can get the uh, form your LLC, get your federal tax ID number, get a draft of an operating agreement. What do you think about those services versus what you offer with a real attorney? Yeah, uh, I think they're terrible. Um, You know, my experience with these quote unquote form providers. And so the largest one that everyone knows is obviously legal zoom. Um, And, you know, it's, they're giving you forms that may work in some circumstances and may not work in others. And, um, I don't think that's the way to go. The, the law in particular is not uh, one size fits all. It's very different. Um, the requirements for each business vary greatly. And, you know, the reality is people like the thought of legal Zoom because it seems inexpensive to them and they don't want to go through the process of hiring an attorney because it used to be very cumbersome to find an attorney. Uh, Mm -hmm. our platform, our site has has taken that away. So you don't have to call and email attorneys. You can find an attorney by posting your project in two minutes. The other good thing is, you know, when you're receiving responses from 10 different attorneys, you can really get a feel for where the prices are. Um, and, and, and more importantly, you're getting individualized legal service. So, you know, your operating agreement isn't going to, be found invalid at a later date, which is what happens with a lot of these forms. Um, You know, me being in the construction realm, being a construction litigator, I specialize in what are called mechanics liens. And so if a contractor hasn't been paid, you have to go through a statutory process of recording a mechanics lien. Now these form providers, these form legal providers try and do this. And I would say 75% of the time, the mechanics lien forms that they give people are found to be invalid and fail. And so then these people pay for these forms and they get nothing in return. Um, And and I think that's what happens a lot. And so, you know, what we're doing is, you know, we're we're taking the legwork out of finding an attorney. We're making it easy and we're making it easy for people to find the perfect attorney for them. So I'm not big on forms. Of course, I'm an attorney. uh, So maybe I am biased. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I think there are oftentimes become more, problems and more costs associated with using the form than with getting an attorney at the outset, right? You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. you pay less for something, you pay for, you buy something that's cheap, it breaks after a year or two, you have to buy something uh, to replace it. And and I, I feel very much that way about forms and legal services. So, you know, my recommendation is always do it right the first time and be done with it. And I think the way to do it right is to get an attorney and get the personalized an individualized service that you need. We've got about a minute. I, I wanted to ask you one other question before we let you go. Uh, what are some of the questions? You know, people who are starting a no business think about their business, but they don't think a lot about legal until they realize they have to incorporate or whatever. <clears throat> what are some of the basic questions that um, a person needs to ask when they're using your service and has two or three lawyers responding to them. What are, what are the things that they need as a consumer uh, that are the most important things that they need to ask the attorney? Yeah. First off, have you done this before? No question. The most important thing. All right. Mm-hmm. If they say no, <laughs> you, you probably shouldn't use them. Uh, the next okay. one is, you know, what can I expect? What is the process? And so if they've done it before and they've done it many times, they can tell you, here's how long it's going to take. Here are the steps that need to be taken. Here are the costs along the way. Um, And then the third one, I think the most important thing is, are you responsive, right? Nobody gets, when people get frustrated with their attorney is when their attorney never gets back to them. I think that's when the legal relationship really breaks down and fails. And so I think by asking that question, you're putting the attorney on notice that, hey, I expect you to be responsive, and if you're not going to be responsive, I don't want you to take this engagement. Um, so those are the three questions that I think are the most important when you're talking to attorneys. Good. Matthew, uh, thank you for being here today. Give us your website one more time. Yeah, it's www.legalservicesLink.com. 
and we'll have we'll post on our website uh, recalculating.biz your uh, your website contact information. As uh, always, Matthew, thank you for joining us and in discussing a very important issue for starting a new business. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Dan, you too. Now, Dan, now a word from our sponsor. Don't let hackers get your data. Email is insecure and can't handle large files. Instead, use Biscom's Secure File Transfer product. Military-grade security that's as easy to use as email, and it can handle attachments of any size. Visit Biscom.com for your free trial and make sure your private communications stay private. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. Well, I think the story today, Don, is uh, of the last two days is the collapse of the oil market. Um, we crossed uh, a very important support level. Um, if you looked at a chart of the price of West Texas Intermediate Crude, you would have seen that 48 had been a bottom uh, three times going into yesterday. Uh, we got a bounce off of 48 this morning, but then it reversed the trend and we went below 48. Um, this has a, a huge implication for, for lots of reasons, all, virtually all over the world. We came down from 54, 55, um, and we've come off almost $7. That has a um, significant impact on, obviously, the revenue that domestic oil companies and OPEC and foreign oil companies have. Uh, it helps in some cases because lowering the cost of crude oil makes it, make, for those people who are buying it, uh, it makes it uh, less expensive. But even at $53, $54 a barrel, um, only the, the the most recent frackers uh, are making a profit. The traditional drillers are not making a profit this level. We need somewhere around 60 to 65. And I was one of those people who thought uh, with the stabilization of crude oil at the OPEC meetings this past winter that we might see a chance of uh, $60 crude oil by the end of the first quarter. Uh, I'm... Uh, I look like I'm going to be wrong because we we could be down into the uh, uh, mid 40s, uh, depending on what's happening the rest of this month. Uh, I, I believe that that creates enormous pressure on the economies of all the OPEC nations and all the export nations, like Russia, for example, which is not an OPEC member, but it's an economy that's totally based on oil. These countries have seen devastation in their revenues over the last two and almost three years since they started the oil war in November of 2014. And the the capitulation in the production cuts uh, that went into effect in, in, in January created a, a situation where uh, you had um, uh, a recovery in price and uh, on a hopeful basis that uh, production uh, would stabilize. Uh, I wrote a piece uh, for I think Constitution.com where I cautioned investors that we may see, uh, in fact, that OPEP is going into a death spiral. And what I mean by that, Don, is that um, let's try and make it simple for our listeners. If the world's production capacity is 100,000 barrels of oil a day, and um, OPEC decided they needed to cut it by uh, 10,000 barrels. So they cut their production by 10,000. On the other hand, we in the United States with our frackers developing more and more oil resources are bringing that oil 10,000 barrels a day that OPEC cut to the market from our fracking operations and other oil operations, which means we really didn't decrease the overall production of crude oil we just decreased the production of crude oil to OPEC, that OPEC has in Russia. And as and I think they are in a death spiral in that they're going to have to start continuing to cut production in order to try and hold the, the price of crude oil. And America will just continue to come in and take market share and market share so that OPEC is now in a non-win position. 
uh, as they continue to try and cut production, we'll continue to east, increase production and take market share away from OPEC. So you could be seeing the, literally the beginning of the end of the OPEC cartel, not only from the oil influence, but the political influence of what they've been doing and the financial support for terrorist groups around the world. Means also that our gasoline prices are probably going to go a little bit lower, which puts more money in the pocket of the, the consumer and, more importantly for our program, the small businessman or woman. Much as we try and use the Internet as a way to communicate and seek out new business opportunities, uh, nothing's more powerful than a face-to-face -face meeting with a customer and, or a prospect, and that means you got to get in a car or an airplane and get there, and you're going to spend fuel. Um, I, I think that that's an important issue. Now, the second piece that we got to deal with is that this week the Federal Reserve is meeting, and uh, the, the market has pretty well baked in a 100% chance that they're going to raise interest rates by a quarter of 1%. Now, while the conventional wisdom, Don, is that interest rates are going to go up a quarter of 1% and that the Fed is going to announce that they're going to be more aggressive in rates, there was a report that came out late last week from the Dallas Fed that shows a weakening of the economy. In fact, the Fed forecast out of the Dallas Fed is that GDP for 2017 might be as low as 1.2%. That could have a, a real cooling effect so as the Fed governors meet this week to decide what they're going to do about interest rates, I don't know at the moment how influential that Federal Reserve of Dallas report is on a declining economy might, in fact, stop the Fed from raising interest rates. The market is not expecting that. And so that if, in fact, the Fed did not raise interest rates, um, you could see a significant rally in the bond market but you would also could see a significant fall off in the American equity market. Um, I think it becomes very difficult for a small businessman today uh, to try and really begin to figure out where he or she is going because the signals are so mixed today, um, both in the administration and in, in, in the economy. We're not quite sure where we're headed as a, as a country. Uh, I think we started this new administration with uh, great enthusiasm and energy given the number of executive orders that Mr. Trump uh, issued in the first week or two of his, uh, of his campaign or his, his office as president. But I also think that there's a situation going on where now you begin to see messages that um, some people are beginning to wonder whether we're going to tax, get a tax cut at all. Some people are saying that the Obamacare revision is now dead in the House. So we have two major pieces of Mr. Trump's agenda coming under fire, and, and there are discussions now, less than two months into his presidency, that those two pieces of things may not happen. Um, and so that creates uncertainty for the markets and creates uncertainty for the small businessman because the, the hope that they were going to have that Trump is going to make this economy grow, and now are beginning to, not only are the, the, the hopes and desires beginning to wane, so are the hopes and desires of the, the general market and, and the small business people. Don? Well, uh, Dan, um, I see our next guest is um, uh, waiting to come on. Uh, you know, you always um, amaze me with your uh, analysis uh, it makes makes me a little scared, but a little um, um, uh, how should we say uh, optimistic. Uh, yeah. uh, the New York the New York Times today uh, led its um, uh, columns with the idea that uh, uh, 24 million Americans will lose their uh, health care insurance. That's more people than uh, uh, signed up for Obamacare. So I'm still trying to figure that out. But uh, <laughs> let's go to Let's go to our next guest, uh, as someone I've really look, been looking forward to because I've uh, talked with him before, and he's um, Keith Hall is president of the National Association of the Self-Employed. Uh, Keith, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, Good morning, uh, Keith. I, I'm, I'm sorry? 
I said, I was just saying good morning to Keith. This is Dan Perkins. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Don. Good morning. I'm going to turn it over to Dan to start. Uh, Keith, uh, first, we'd love to hear uh, about your background, because I happen to know it's kind of electric and and fun. And then uh, we we have some questions for you. Well, I'd rather not say everything that I've done in my life, because then you'll know how exactly old I am. So I just can keep the age to, to a minimum here. Uh, The the thing I'm most proud of in in my career is is I consider myself a a small businessman. I've had small businesses. I've had the pleasure and the angst of having to meet payroll every Friday. Uh, With the National Association for the Self-Employed, we've got about 150,000 members all across the country. Uh, Most of them, about 80%, uh, have no employees. About half work out of their house. And on a daily basis, our goal here is just to help those guys manage some of the things that you guys have already talked about this morning, some of the uncertainty, some of the mixed signals we get from from Congress, from the administration. And, and I think the thing I am most proud of in my history um, is the fact that I think we make a difference for those 27 million self-employed people out there every day. That's what I'm most proud of. Well, you know, Keith, um, there was a recent study done about small business in America. And uh, there's about um, 2.4 million businesses incorporated in one form or another in the United States. Uh, About 30,000 of those employ more than 500 people. The rest, almost over 2 million, um, employ people of 500 or less. And a lot of them are like me and you, self-employed, single proprietor. Um, We began talking about uh, doing this show from our other show because uh, we felt that Mr. Trump might present an opportunity for small businesses and self-employed people contemplating self-employment, a government that was going to encourage the formation of business and people starting new careers and starting new businesses. Uh, I think I, I won't speak for Don, I'll speak for myself. I still believe that's a tremendous opportunity. I'm curious about what you think about the opportunities are for small business people today. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I think the administration, I think uh, most members of, of the House and the Senate, if you talk to individuals uh, one-on-one basis, no matter which side of the aisle they sit on, All of them agree that small business is the leading economic driver of our country uh, for years. And again, you know, one of my favorite things is the way we uh, um, torture the numbers these days with all the statistics out there. But but most would agree that about 70 percent of all new jobs generated in this country come from small business. So it, it is a force that everyone recognizes is extremely important. And I think this administration has a unique opportunity to promote that growth. Now, regardless, and this is my unique spin, I think, regardless of, of the administration's goals or wishes or even those of Congress, I think the growth in small business is, is going to happen no matter what uh, for a number of reasons. The, the world is getting so much smaller Uh, based on technology, that the use of technology, ability for people to work from home, to manage uh, responsibilities that they used to have to go to the office, that alone encourages other companies to employ those independent contractor types because it's easier. The paperwork's easier. Complexities are easier. Government regulations are easier. There's so many reasons that that individual segment of the economy is going to explode. Uh, The Kauffman Foundation for Entrepreneurial Spirit estimates that by the year 2020, which is not that far away, that there will be about 50 million Schedule Cs or self-employed business owners in this country. Kind of put that in perspective, the IRS processes about 150 million tax returns total. So 50 million of those, just three years from now, one out of every three tax returns will include a Schedule C or a small business. Now, that is a giant number. So, again, I I hope and I'm extremely optimistic 
through some equity in the tax code opportunities, uh, the ability to kind of level the playing field, if you will, with the, the self-employed micro business marketplace, with bigger businesses. I think this administration has a great opportunity to support that tremendous growth that I believe is coming no matter what we choose. Steve, let me share with you a, a, a thought that I have on a broader scale than just the United States. Uh, I was reading today um, about what's going on in the Netherlands, what's going on in France, what's going on in Germany, what's going on in, in the U.K., and and what we have is a, um, a surge in a more conservative, um, nationalistic, base growing around the world that started with Brexit in, in England and came to the United States with Mr. Trump. I think that as as we as a as a world begin to reject the globalist point of view and become more free people, um, entrepreneurship and small businesses formation could be a global res- revolution, not just in the United States. And opportunities for small business people in the United States to deal with small business people in Europe, I think it's something that could come uh, in, in a few years. What do you think? Well, again, I, I think that uh, I, I certainly do not disagree with, with your statements. I, I think that, that most likely is exactly correct. But I would love to say that back to you from the other end of the scale, you know, rather than the, the macroeconomic view of, of worldwide and the impact of long-term interest rates and what the Fed's going to do in, in Brexit and what that's going to have to do on the European market. And all those things are obviously important, but the exact opposite end of the scale is just a guy, just a gal, has an idea in their community to meet a need. And they start their own business. They build a website. They meet the needs in their community, and before you know it, they hire an employee. They just created not only their own job, but they created another job. That's where the economic growth comes from. And I think the typical small business owner out there uh, reads the newspaper. Hopefully they listen to you guys on the radio, and and they understand the impact of some of those macroeconomic reasons out there. But on a day-to-day basis, on what they do when they wake up on Thursday morning, all of those things translate into a smaller world, uh, uh, increased ability for them to meet a need in their community, and to create their own job. Now, in the overall definition, without getting too sappy, that probably is a pretty good definition of freedom, that you have the ability to create your own job, to meet a need in your community – and then create a job for someone else. You know, not only would I consider that a nice definition of freedom, but that is also making a difference. Yeah, Keith, do you think that uh, with the advent of the internet, it has made it easier or more difficult for that small entrepreneur to start a business? Well, I think I think it's actually both. I, I think in the overall, it, it's made it much easier. Uh, It's made it much easier because the markets are bigger. It is way easier to find your customer, to find a niche, to find that need in your community. And and now we talk about community. You know, even a time as as short as 10 years ago, your community was almost like a geographic location. Uh, It seems like today your community is not limited by where you live or by some map, but your community is more of a list of attributes of people that need your service. So I think the Internet has, has really changed the definition of what community is. At the same time, it does become more difficult uh, because you don't have as much social interaction. You don't have the ability to reach out right. and, and see the look on someone's face, which certainly helps in meeting needs. So I think right. it has it, it improved our opportunities as small business owners and made everything easier. But at the same time, it brings a whole new set of issues and skill sets that we have to build if we want to be successful. Let me ask you one more question, then I'll turn it over to Don. Um, What is it that your organization does? And by the way, what's what's your website, uh, which we'll post later today on our our, our website. What does your organization do for self-employed people? 
Well, the main thing we do, our, our goal at, at a top level is to help them be more successful. Uh, the way we gauge that internally here amongst the staff is we say if we can answer one more question today, then we've been successful. Uh, our website at nase.org, uh, we have lots of little calculators, frequently asked questions, uh, what ifs. We, we put out a, uh, a monthly magazine with profiles of other small business owners. Uh, but the most important thing we do is we have a, a list of specialists, if you will, uh, that just provide feedback one-on-one -on -one with our members uh, answering their questions. You know, one of the challenges most of the smallest of small businesses have is they don't have a CFO on staff. They don't have a chief marketing director. They don't have an IT specialist. They don't have a, uh, an internal, you know, the business owners doing everything. They're even taking the trash out on Saturday. And so by providing some experts for tax planning, general business, marketing, uh, even some contract lawyer type that can that help with those questions. Uh, the main thing we tell our members and the main things I, I love to tell small business owners out there, you know, we talked about the benefit of the Internet, is, is if you have an Internet connection, you have resources. You know, you're not alone. As a small business owner, it's so easy, you know, to wake up on, on Sunday morning, you put the kids to bed late the night before, and it's just overwhelming, and you feel like you're out there all alone. But with organizations like ours, like the NASC, uh, the IRS has a great website at irs.gov. The Small Business Administration is making new commitments to small business every day. So what we try to commit to people, uh, to get, commit to their memory, is that you have resources. And, and that's what we want to be more than anything else, is a resource for the micro business owner. Don? Hmm. Well, I have a lot of questions. Uh, just one statistic that I found interesting. Um, seven years ago, the average um, uh, cell area was 35 miles for a small business. It is now 78 miles and expected to be 100 miles uh, by 2020. Uh, it goes along with what you were saying about expanding your marketing area. Uh, but, Keith, I'll ask a question. Uh, Self-employed oftentimes means one or two people and being alone by yourself. What, what are some of the uh, issues uh, that um, are unique to being self-employed that your, your, your organization has identified and tries to help? We, we over the years, we, we do a survey of our members. We, we travel around the country. We do lots of, uh, you know, online seminars and webinars. We do face-to-face -face seminars. Uh, and we, we try our best to listen. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think this uh, credit to my mom, but I, I was always told you got two ears and one mouth. That means you're supposed to listen more than you talk. Uh, so we've done our best to listen to small business. And, and over the years, three things have always come up consistently as their concerns. Uh, one is access to capital, just funding. Uh, they need money for their new restaurant, for new equipment. They need a new computer, even the smallest of, of needs. The difficulty with funding, access to capital. Second is complexities in the tax code, just understanding what they're supposed to do. You know, it's my belief that a vast majority of people want to do the right thing. They want to comply, uh, but the tax code is just very difficult. And, again, most of them don't have a CPA or CFO on staff. And then third, which is kind of moving to the top of the list these days, is access to affordable health care. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a small business owner, you're not typically part of a large company group health plan through Blue Cross Blue Shield. So that self-employed business owner that may just have one or two other employees, uh, finding access through the ACA even these days, it has been very difficult. So those are kind of the three things that we've learned over, you know, gosh, 40 years, and, and those have been consistent three things. Uh, a vast majority of our questions that we answer day in and day out relate to one of those three questions. Hmm. Well, um, on the note of the health care, I know you have someone on your staff who's uh, an expert in it, but uh, uh, how do you see the uh, efforts by uh, President Trump to uh, um, uh, repeal Obamacare and uh, provide <clears throat> something else? Well, I would hesitate to say that I know anyone who is an expert on health care. <laughs> it just seems so complicated these days. I would question anyone who claimed to be an expert on any subject related to health care. 
Uh, but, but I think the thing that we find for small business, and I know for me personally, um, was what, I, what you guys talked about right before I came on, and, and that is uncertainty or mixed signals. Uh, I think at the end of the day, our culture, uh, our society, our country, we want to provide access to health care to everyone. We, we have the need to do that. We also have this cultural need to help those who, who need help with, with, with the financial side of it, with access side of it. And I think those are great things. I, I love that we do that as a culture. Uh, regardless of your background, your religious affiliation, where you're from, who, what you believe, virtually all of us believe we're called to help those people. So I think that's, that's awesome. But at the end of the day, we've still got to figure out how to pay for that and, and who pays for that. And no matter what scenario you look at, costs are going to go up. And for small business, I think the goal is just tell us what the plan is. Give us the rules let the rules be the same for everyone, and then we'll figure it out. Uh, for example, as a self-employed business owner, one of the things that we talk about every day is that insurance premiums that the self-employed business owner pays for aren't treated the same under the tax code as the health insurance premiums paid for by big business. So through this process, you know, Mr. Trump, Congress, senators – um, Congressman, please, whatever we choose to do, whatever this program is, let the playing field be level. Let us know what the rules are, and then small business, creative, intuitive, problem-solving small business owners will figure out how to deal with it, and we'll figure out how to pay for it. Just decide what the rules are, be consistent, and then let's move forward. Um. That's that, that's pretty good. Uh, you can almost uh, push that for uh, just about uh, anything uh, anything else. We all want fairness in, in our, our lives, but sometimes we don't get it, um, particularly if we're a well, small business. I actually had, if I can, if I can say one other thing, I actually had the opportunity to testify before a House Small Business Committee hearing on the Affordable Care Act and, and what the replacement could be, what a repeal might look like, what a repair might look like. And I actually was asked a question in the hearing on the record from one of the congressmen, and the question basically was, you know, it, it appears to me that we have difficulty up here working together, the two sides of the aisle. Don't you believe, and the question is to me, don't you believe that we've got to work on this together? And, and I actually responded, and I may not be invited. <coughs> excuse, I may not be invited back again after this. But, but I actually responded. Well, in the in the last hour, I have heard from both sides of the aisle here, from both parties. One party says, if we do this, costs are going to go up. Immediately, the other side says, if we don't do this, costs are going to go up. So the one consensus that everyone has, no matter which way you look at the problem, is it's still going to come down to cost. So if we <laughs> just figure out what that cost is, whether that means a different tax structure, whether that means a different subsidy structure, whether that means a, a different economic approach to interstate uh, health insurance sales, however you approach that, let's figure out what the cost is. And then let's all pay our fair share. That would end up being working on this together. But I thought it was interesting that in the conversation, both sides are saying exactly the same thing, except then no, kind no. of pointing the finger at the other side. <laughs> I can't. Um, I can't hear you. You're talking too loud. <laughs> uh, I, I understand. And I and I. Um, I listen to what you said, and I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. But I believe that um, the American people made a decision at the polls in November because they were told that Obamacare was not sustainable, that premiums were going up 100 to 116% in some states, 75 in others, Insurers were dropping out of the marketplace. And so that the Republicans ran on the basis of repeal and replace. 
I found it to be amazing that when it came time to stand up and be counted, they didn't have anything. And I wonder if the pushback from the American electorate, if they come out with a plan that, in fact, winds up costing more than what Obamacare did, if that will not cause an enormous backlash at the polls in 2018. Well, you know what? What I think is the most important thing we can do today, and, and every time I have an opportunity to speak to, speak to a, a group of small business owners, um, anytime I have an opportunity to speak before a committee of Congress, I mean, anytime I have a chance to open my mouth, this is what I say at some point, and that is we, the people, need to make our voice known. I think so many times, like you just said, we, we kind of wait until election day to speak, and then we mm-hmm. hope our votes speak for us. And I think that is a mistake on our part. I think we've talked about the Internet. We've talked about the, the shrinking of the globe. We have the ability to sit at our desk today with an Internet connection and let your congressional leaders know what's important to you. We have on our website at NASE.org a legislative action center that you can put in your zip code, hit um, return. It will bring up your congressman. It will bring up your two senators with a little email icon that gives you the ability to email your congressional representatives right from your house. The more we can tell them what is important to us, the more that we can say this is the way we are going to vote the better chance we have of them listening to us. So, hmm. so my call to action, the, the thing I would ask for from listeners, from people I have a chance to speak to, uh, from my next-door neighbor, is take a few minutes, sit down on your computer. No matter what you believe, no matter you know, how you lean, where are your goals, no matter what you believe, let your congressional leaders know what's important to you. That is our best chance to make a difference. Keith, I hate to cut you off, but we have uh, one more commercial uh, from our advertiser before we get off the air. We've been uh, talking with Keith Hall. He's president of the National Association of of the Self-Employed, and we want him back again because he's always so articulate. Thank you, Keith, so much for coming. Thank Thank you, you, Keith. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Take care. Hate your old fax machine? You can now fax through email. Simply write an email, attach the document, and send. Works with all major email providers. Get rid of the noisy and expensive old fax machine. And try Biscom's Cloud Fax. Our solutions are great for businesses of all sizes. Visit Biscom.com for your free trial. That's B-I-S-C-O-M dot com. Well, Dan, we're getting close to the end of the show. We've had two great uh, guests um, uh, brought up a lot. Uh, You want to have any final comments? We've got about a minute left. I thought uh, both in both guests were excellent guests. I want to make sure that we have their websites uh, put up on on, uh, recalculating.biz so that we can can create links for our listeners to go and and spend some more time with these people. Um, I think it's, I think what Keith said is important for us as small business people speak our mind, and to make sure that we're telling our elected representatives what it is that we want. Um, I have grave concerns that um, the Republicans for eight years tried to change Obamacare, and the president always vetoed over it, never got into the Senate. And now when they have the opportunity to change it, they can't figure out what to do. Um, I'm concerned that that carries over to uh, tax reform, immigration, and... uh, the momentum that Mr. Trump established may come under serious attack, and we have to be diligent in helping our Congress and senators understand what it is we're looking for. So I thought they were both great guests, and I look forward to having them on again. Don? All I could say is goodbye because we're getting close to the end. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're also on on um, Tuesday or Thursday evenings. What is it, 9 o'clock, Don? Then 10 o'clock Eastern Time. 10 o'clock Eastern Time. New show. And um, so if you liked it today, maybe you'll like it again on Thursday evening at 10. This is Dan Perkins, and thanks for listening. 
Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's show was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, for past shows and special offers. And until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success.